creativity seems related to IQ in that more in, people with higher IQs are likely to be creative, or if you take people who are noted for their creativity, there's a high probability that they'll have a higher IQ. But there's more to it than IQ. Um, and and what, what creativity seems to be associated with, then again, depends on whether or not, on how you define creativity. Because you could define it as the sum total of creative achievements that you've made in your life, which would be the actual production of, say, artifacts of one form or another, performances or inventions or artworks or, or, or what have you. We'll go over the dimensions in, the middle, in a minute. Or you could also define it as the proclivity to engage in creative thought. And I think we'll start with that first. So what does it mean to think creatively? It's, it's sort of like, it's something like this. You imagine that I toss you out an idea and there's some probability that when I toss you that idea that that will trigger off other ideas in your imagination. So you could think about it as a threshold issue. If you're not very creative, I'll throw you an idea and hardly any other ideas will be triggered. And the ones that will be triggered are going to be very closely associated with that initial idea. So let's say I tossed each of you an idea and I asked you to think, tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, so what we would see first is that the first thing that comes to mind for you the first thing that comes to mind, in, like, in all likelihood, would be shared by many of you. Okay, so then you could think about that as a common response, right? And so that's a less creative response. And then there'll be some things that come to mind for you that are, that are so idiosyncratic that you're the only person that thinks it and no one can understand it. Well, that, that's also not exactly creative because the thing that you, for something to be creative, it has to be novel and useful at the same time. That's sort of a rough definition, creative. Uh, something creative is novel and useful. And obviously, you know, there, there's, a, there's a certain amount of judgment that goes along with that, clearly. But if it's too novel, then no one else can understand it, and it's unlikely to be useful. So there's, there's, a, there's a range of convenience. So anyways, if you want to decide if something's creative, like what we would do, for, I could say to you, uh, okay, in the next three minutes, I want you to write down all the uses you can think of for a brick. So, okay, so someone tell me a use for a brick. Breaking windows. Uh, a pumice for your feet. Yes, okay. What else can you use a brick for? Build a wall. Build a wall. It's a very small wall. <laughs> <laughs> a wall for ants. <laughs> and what, what else? Paperweight. Paperweight. Okay, okay. Well, so you, you get the idea. No, you're not feeling very mouthy today, obviously. But so, so you see that, so if we gathered your responses, say I said you have to think up 20 items, that, 20 things that, that uh, you could do with a brick, then a bunch of the things that you thought would be the same, and some people would come up with something different. Like yours was reasonably different, the one about using it as a pumice stone for your feet. Uh, someone else might have come up with that, but it's, it's a good creative response because it's un unexpected and it, you could actually do it. You know? So anyway, so you'll get a graph of probability of response, right? And the more probable, the less creative. R roughly speaking. It's not the only criteria though because you also have to look at utility. So if I said, okay, you've got three minutes to write down as many uses as you can think of for a brick, I would score that in a variety of ways. The first thing I would do is just figure out how many uses you generated. That's called fluency. And we could also do that. I could just say, write down as many words as you can that begin with the letter S in three minutes or that begin with the letter C or four letter words that begin with the letter D. You know, I can, I can constrain it. And if I counted how many words you generated, if I had an IQ measure and I had a measure of how many words you generated, IQ plus the number of words that you generated would be a better predictor of your creativity than just IQ. So there's this fluency element. That's, and, and so that's something like the rate at which you can produce, say, verbal ideas. And one of the things we do know about, um, about the creativity dimension of, of openness is that it is associated with fluency. And it's also associated with originality. And originality would be how improbable your use was compared to the uses generated by other people. So, so you, anyway, so you can think of, you, you get thrown an idea and there's some probability that that will co-activate other ideas. And if it co-activates many other ideas, that's like fluency. And if it co-activates ideas that are quite distant from the original idea, something like that, and you could, you could track distance by comparing it to, to probability that other people have generated it, then that's also another indication of creativity. 
So they have to be unlikely resp many unlikely responses that are useful. That's what creativity is, roughly speaking. And then you can fractionate it into different dimensions. So that's creative thinking. But then creative achievement would be the ability to take those original ideas and then actually to implement them in the world. And that's obviously much more different than merely being creative. And so, and then what creativity is depends on which of those measurement routes that you take. Now I developed a questionnaire with one of my students, Shelley Carson, about, geez, it's just about 30 years ago now, 20 years ago, I guess, called the Creative Achievement Questionnaire. And I'll show you that here. And, and I'll show you some of the things that, that are interesting about it. Um, you know, you hear very frequently people say things like, everyone's creative. It's like, that's wrong, okay? It's wrong. It's just as wrong as saying that everyone's extroverted. First of all, you have to be pretty damn smart to be creative because otherwise you're just gonna get to where other people have already got and that's not creative by definition. So, so being fast and being out there at the front of things really makes a difference. And then you also have to have these divergent thinking capabilities and that's part of your trait structure. And creative people are really different than non-creative people. You know, partly because, for example, they're highly motivated to do creative things and to experience novelty and to, and, to, and to chase down aesthetic experiences and to attend movies and to read fiction and to go to museums and to enjoy poetry and, and, and to enjoy music that's not conventional music, for example. These aren't trivial differences. And so, and so it's, a real, it's a real misstatement to make the proposition that everyone's creative. It's just simply not the case. It's a matter of wishful thinking. It's like saying that everyone's intelligent. It's like, well, if everyone's intelligent, then the, the term loses all of its meaning. Because any term that you can apply to every member of a category abs has absolutely no meaning. Now, that doesn't, and you know, the other thing you wanna be thinking about here is that, don't be thinking that creativity is such a good thing. It's a high risk, high return strategy. So if you're creative, you just try this. There's creative people in this room, man. You guys are gonna have a hell of a time monetizing your creativity. It's virtually impossible. It's really, really difficult because First of all, let's say you make an original product. You think the world will beat a pathway to your door if you build a better mousetrap. It's like, that's complete rubbish. It isn't, it, it isn't true in the least. If you make a good creative product, you've probably solved about 5% of your problem. Because then you have marketing, which is insanely difficult, and then you have sales, and then you have customer support, and then you have to build an organization. And you have to, if it's really novel, you have to tell people what the hell the thing is. You know, we built this future authoring program, right? And we, uh, it's, uh, it's available for people online. So how do you market that? No one knows what that is. And that's a real problem. If you write a book, well, then you have the problem that another million people have also written a book. But if you produce something that's completely new and doesn't have a category, people can't search for it online. How are they gonna find it? So you, you just have, and then you have pricing problems. And it's really unbelievably difficult to produce something creative and then monetize it, and even worse, if you're the creative person, let's say you have a spectacular invention. You've got no money, right? You've got no customers. Th those are big problems. And so maybe you go and you find a venture capitalist. We start with family and friends, because that's how it works. You raise money for your product. You raise money from your family and friends. That's assuming you have family and friends that have some money and that they're going to give it to you. And most people aren't in that situation. So it's a terrible barrier right off the bat. And then, of course, you're putting your family and friends at substantial financial risk because the probability that your stupid idea is going to make money is virtually zero, even if it's a really brilliant idea. And so then let's say, well, you get past family and friends and you get venture capital, capitalists involved because that's often the next step, or an angel investor. That's, there's, there's steps in building a business. Family and friends, angel investor, that's some rich guy that you've happened to meet some manner, in some way who's, who's into this sort of thing and is willing to provide you with some money to get your product off the ground. Well, how much of your product is that person gonna take? Well, most of it, most of it. And then if you get a venture, and no wonder, because you, know, you don't have any money, how are you gonna bargain for control over your product? He'll just say, well, do you want the money or not? And if your answer is no, then he'll go and do something else with his money. It's not like there's no shortage of things that you can do with your money. There's a million things you can do with it. So you're not in a great bargaining position. And then if you get venture capitalists involved, they'll take another big chunk. And maybe if they're not very straight with you, they'll just throw you out. Because maybe by that point in the company's development, you're nothing but a pain in the neck. Because what do you know about marketing and sales and customer service and building an organization and running a business? Like, you don't have a clue. So why do they need you? So even if you're successful at generating a new idea and you put it into a business, 
the probability that you, as the originator of the, of the idea, are going to make some money from it is very, very low. So don't be thinking that creativity is, such a, is, such a, is something you would want to curse yourself with. Now, you know, it's not all bad because it, it opens up avenues of experience for creative people that aren't available to people who aren't creative. But it definitely is a high-risk, high-return strategy. You know, so the overwhelming probability is that you will fail. But a small proportion of creative people succeed spectacularly. And so it's like a lottery in some sense. You're probably going to lose. But if you don't lose, you could win big. And that keeps a lot of creative people going. But also, they don't really have much choice in it. Because if you're a creative person, you're like a, a, a fruit tree that's, that's bearing fruit. So you don't really have, you can suppress it, but it's very bad for you. You know, the creative people I've worked with is if they're not creative, they're miserable. So they have to do it. But, and, and you know, there's real joy and, and pleasure in it and, 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 and psychological utility. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's an intelligent, it's certainly not a conservative strategy for moving forward through life. So, and you know, whenever I talk to people who are creative, and you, you guys should listen to this because I know what I'm talking about. If you happen to be creative, if you're a songwriter, or another kind of musician, or an artist, or, or, or any of the other number of things that you might be. Find a way to make money, and then practice your craft on the side, because you will starve to death otherwise. Now, some, for some of you, that won't be true, but it's a tiny minority. Your best bet is to find a job that will keep body and soul together, and parse off some time that you can pursue your creative thing, because then, well, as a long-term strategy, a medium to long-term strategy, it's a better one. But it's got incredibly difficult for people, musicians for example, it's incredibly difficult for new musicians to monetize their, their craft, even if they're really, really good at it. So it's, it's, well, so anyway, so don't be, so I say, well, everyone's not, everyone's not creative and everybody goes, oh, that's terrible. It's like, it's not so terrible. It's not something, it's not self-evident that you would curse someone with high levels of creativity. So, all right, so here's how our creative achievement questionnaire works. What we did essentially was we thought up how many domains there are in which you might be creative. And this is, remember, when you're designing a questionnaire, you want to be over-inclusive, because the statistics will take care of it, right? So you can, you can take a big area of, of, of potential, you can take a large area and aim your questionnaire at it, and you can do statistics post hoc to see if you're covering the area. If, if, if the things that you're measuring are nicely correlated, they're this, you know, they're, there's something about them that's similar. If they're not correlated, then maybe you're measuring two different things and you can get rid of one of them. That's fine. So we did start with a pretty wide range. We thought, okay, well, what domains can you be creative in? Visual arts, painting and sculpture. Then we had experts sort of rank order levels of achievement within those domains. And so if you were a painter, you could, zero gives you, I have no training or recognized talent in this area. Okay, so you really want to keep an eye on the zeros, all right? So then, I have taken lessons, people have commented on my talents, I have won a prize, my work has been critiqued in national publications. All right, so you get, you get, you get zero to seven points, but you can indicate more than, you know, maybe that's happened to you more than once. So, and what happens, this is interesting, eh, is that the higher you are up in this hierarchy, the more likely it is that those things have happened to you more than once. And that's, that's another example of this weird thing called the Pareto Principle, or Price's Law, which is that it's sort of, as good things happen to you, the probability that more good things will happen increases. Right, so because once you're famous, people give you all sorts of opportunities to do other things, right? So your, your, your success doesn't go like this. It goes like this, zero, 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 skyrocket. That's how it works. But getting from zero to, getting from zero to one, if you're starting a business, the hardest customer you'll ever get is your first one, and then the second hardest one will be your second one. It's virtually impossible to get a first customer, because they're going to say to you, first of all, you're going to be selling to people who are basically conservative, and they're not going to be evaluate, they're not going to be willing or able to evaluate whether your damn product is good for anything. And so they'll say, well, who are your other customers? And if your answer to that is, well, we don't have any, it's like, well, then why? They're going to be the first one. No, because people don't stick their necks out at all, not a bit. Ever. And so unless you're well established in the market, especially if you're dealing with a big company, you can just bloody well forget it. It's like a three year sales cycle anyways. It's because big corporations move very, very slowly. And you might be able to find a small company that doesn't have much money who would be willing to use your stupid product for nothing if you're really nice to them. And you can get one customer that way. It's very, very difficult. 
And so you'll, you'll end up, you know, and what do you think the royalty, just out of curiosity? So I've written a book. It's going to be published by Penguin Random House in, in January. What do you think the royalty is for an author on a book? So you make something creative. You get a percentage of the sale. What do you think the percentage is, just out of curiosity? Guess. Yeah, it's like 5%. So think about that. So that means that you make your thing and 95% of it belongs to someone else. And that's if things are going quite well for you. And it doesn't really matter what you manufacture or produce. That's about what you can expect. Sales, marketing, distribution, it eats it, it, eats it all up. So, so, well, anyways, you need to know these things because they're not self-evident. Okay, so, seems to be working all by itself. All right, so let's take a look. Well, how else can you have creative achievement? Well, you can be a musician. I have no training or recognized talent. Recordings of my composition have been sold publicly. That's the top end. My composition has been copyrighted, recorded, critiqued in a local population, publication. I have composed an original piece of music. Well, let's try this. How many of you have composed an original piece of music? Wow, there's lots of creative people in here. That's very impressive. So there must be 10 or 11 people in here. Oh, that's cool. So how about uh, your, your copies, composition has been copyrighted? How about it's been, uh, the recordings have been sold publicly and actually sold? How many people? Two? Two. Okay. Well, so what you can see is there's a rapid drop-off in the number of people who say yes. How many of you fit into category zero? I have no training or recognized talent in this area. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Zero is the median score on all of these. Median is the score that's the most likely for people to have, right? It's different than the mean. Median score is zero. So what's the median score in the entire creative achievement questionnaire? Zero. You, you add up all, over all 13 domains, the most typical score is zero. So that's how creative people are. They're zero creative, not at all. Yes? So it's not even necessarily that everybody has a certain degree of creativity, but for the most part, most people are not really creative at all. Well, the thing is, you could say that people have, people, all people are creative and that all people can generate ideas, but the issue isn't whether or not you can generate ideas, it's whether or not you can generate ideas that are different from the ideas that other people generate. That's the critical issue. Because, I mean, it depends on how you define it. You could, you, well, the novelty is a huge part of it, but that's, it, that's sort of built into the definition of creative. It has to be novel and useful. And if your idea that you generate is the same as the idea that a bunch of other people have, it's not. It's an idea, fair enough. And if you define creativity that way, then everyone's creative. But it's a foolish way of defining creativity because everyone does it. 